Good afternoon and welcome uh, to Grand Rounds today. Please remember to sign the attendance record and please also remember to uh, fill out the program evaluations and if you could please give us uh, some ideas in regards to future topics or future speakers. Uh, today it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Brenton Meyer. Dr. Meyer is board certified in both uh, anesthesiology and the pain medicine. He did his fellowship in pain medicine at the Mayo Clinic uh, where he stayed and he is now a senior associate consultant in the Division of Anesthesiology and Pain Medicine and uh, instructor in anesthesiology at the Mayo College of Medicine. And he kindly accepted our invitation to drive down today to update us on the essentials of inpatient opioid management. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Meyer. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for inviting me to uh, your grand rounds to talk about inpatient opioid management. I actually started off my training uh, thinking I was going to do neurosurgery, and within about three months, something hit me over the head, and I decided to switch paths into anesthesiology. Some of my particular interests are in cancer pain. I was going to do a palliative care fellowship because I see a lot of overlap uh, in the needs between cancer and, and uh, palliative care and kind of the chronic pain patients we see. But uh, inpatient opioid management is something that I do about once every two to three months, but we're constantly uh, getting inpatient consults or curbsides from pretty much any specialty in the hospital asking about how to deal with um, patients. So hopefully you'll find this helpful. I plan to talk for about 35 to 40 minutes and then answer any questions that you have. All right, so the obligatory disclosure uh, slide, I have none. If I had some to disclose, I think that this would be a pretty uh, svelte way to do it. Um, so objectives for today. I really hope to discuss why pain control is important, and then we'll kind of go through Opioid 101, focusing in on specifics of opioids, uh, some clinical caveats that we should always be aware of um, because of the different patient populations we treat, and then there are cases throughout to kind of work on applying the information. So first of all, why are we talking about pain control in the hospital? Well, I think uh, even though in the last 10 years there's been a lot of interest about pain control, it's still under-recognized and certainly suboptimally managed. We know that if we treat pain control well, we reduce things like morbidity. We might even reduce the risk of somebody converting from acute to chronic pain, even though we don't understand mechanistically exactly how that happens. And in the future, there will be big financial incentives to treating pain well in the hospital and then having a good discharge plan, and we'll talk more about that. So first of all, pain being under-recognized or under-treated. Warfield in 1995 was basically doing a survey of about 130 acute pain services throughout the United States and also decided to look at adult attitudes uh, and incidents of pain in the post-surgical population. And what he found is that about 77 to 80% of patients have pain after surgery, and a large uh, portion of those have moderate to extreme pain. So you think in 2000, within five years of that study coming out, Congress declared war on pain. They said it was the decade of pain in research. Pain became the fifth vital sign. So about three years into that, Applebaum again looked at the incidence of pain in the post-surgical population. And interestingly enough, despite this huge increase in national initiatives to recognize and treat pain, we weren't doing much better. In fact, in some cases, the incidence of pain and the severity of pain was actually going up. So now think about where we are now. Almost 12 years later, we're in the midst of some say an opioid epidemic. The amount of opioids that we prescribe in the inpatient and, out, and outpatient setting has gone up between two and fourfold. So hopefully this reflects in how patients' pain is treated. But the sad reality is we're again not doing much better we're still on a downward slide. So this again is from Applebaum in 2014, looking at 300 post-surgical patients, 86 experienced pain, a large majority had moderate to extreme pain. Interestingly enough, only eight out of nine, or eight out of 10 patients that had pain got pain medicines, and of those, about 40% still had moderate to extreme pain, 
after the first dose. And what's interesting here, if you look in the middle, is that patients are really anxious about pain control in the hospital. It is a big, big concern. So certainly for patient quality of life and patient experience, we should be paying attention to pain control. Above and beyond that, we know that if we don't treat pain well in the hospital, our patients will suffer more than just psychologically. I think we're all probably aware that poorly controlled pain increases sympathetic tone. It releases cortisol. And this has a number of bad effects on our internal systems. Cardiovascular-wise, oxygen demand goes through the roof because of increase in heart rate and blood pressure. And in our susceptible patients, this might just tip them over into a cardiac event. In the endocrine system, we get hyperglycemia. And we know that that's a risk factor for infection, poor wound healing, etc. They also get a catabolic state. If the pain involves the abdominal wall or the chest, then breathing mechanics are impaired. We get splinting, atelectasis, desaturations, poor clearance of secretions, and these are all risk factors for pneumonia. We're probably most aware of the gastrointestinal effects, the functional ileus that most of our patients have when pain is high. They have nausea, vomiting, constipation, they can aspirate, and this, in some patients, can be an end-of-life issue. And then there are other things to the immunologic system, the coagulation cascade, which are equally important but more difficult to really uh, appreciate. So I mentioned a little bit that poor acute pain management is a risk factor from chronic pain. This is one of the studies that showed it from Perkins and Kellett in 2000. They basically looked at 50 articles um, and the incidence of chronic pain after high-risk surgeries. And you can see all the different uh, surgeries listed there and the incidence is towards the right. And what they found when they looked and uh, sub-analyzed the risk factors for developing chronic pain, the number one uh, predictor was the intensity of acute post-operative pain. So again, when patients come into the hospital either for surgery or because of trauma or for some other reason for an acute pain flare, we need to address it quickly and we need to address it well, or they may be set up for years of pain following. So this is to the point about the financial repercussions of uh, poorly controlled pain. This is a slide of the uh, most common reasons for patient readmission after outpatient surgery. And as you can see, pain is the number one reason, outscoring surgical and medical causes combined. On the left side of the screen, you can see what a typical admission for pain control costs these patients between two and $6,000. So you can think, throughout the United States, hospital systems have made hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in the last number of years treating pain in the perioperative period and in the hospital. But this is all changing. With the Accountable Care Act and the redu or Readmission Reduction Program, hospitals are going to start getting reimbursed less if patients are returning for things like pain. And that's particularly salient right now because in this last year, Total knee and total hip arthroplasties were added to the uh, high importance list in that reduction um, program. So if your patients are returning to the hospital because of poorly controlled pain, your reimbursement's gonna go down and it could be a big financial significance. This is just to let you know what JACO uh, is thinking about pain management. This is from January 1st, 2015, just basically letting us and patients know that they expect to be part of their pain control team. That when patients come in and they have pain issues, they should be exposed to non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic strategies. The list of non-pharmacologic strategies is down here, and it's things like mind-body techniques, acupuncture, uh, physical therapy, massage, and the pharmacologic strategies, of course, include opioids, but also non-opioids and adjuvant med medications like the neuropathic agents. And I put this slide up here because while for the rest of the talk I'm going to be mentioning opioid-specific facts and strategies, really to do pain management well and to give your patients a good outcome, you need to incorporate all of these different factors and be screening for issues that relate to these uh, for the entire hospitalization. Ah, God's own medicine. Sir William Osler, uh, he was a famous uh, Canadian physician, one of the four founding professors of Johns Hopkins University, and he wasn't the first and probably not the last to talk about all the wonders of opium. 
For centuries, opium has been an invaluable commodity and, and trade item. And, um, you know, obviously it's still impacting our society in a great way today. So opioids as a class, I think we can all appreciate and accept the fact that they're the mainstay for alleviating moderate to severe pain, especially in the acute setting and in people with malignancy-related pain. But I think we're also aware that in the last 10 years, the use of opioids has expanded to the chronic pain population and for non-malignant causes. What that means for us is there's a huge upswing in opioid-tolerant patients in the inpatient setting, and for many of us, this makes our jobs more difficult. If you think about opioids, this is kind of the um, opioid 101 portion. Mechanistically, they bind to these classical receptors, the mu, the delta, and the kappa. If you look up here, this is a classic uh, table that you'll see in a textbook on pain management or basic pharmacology, which says that these receptors have different functions. In reality, there's a lot of overlap between uh, the receptors, but Suffice it to say, they work at the level of the spinal cord in the brain. There are also peripheral receptors that are responsible for things like constipation. All of the receptors are G proteins that, when bound, they lead to an intracellular cascade that leads to increased release of calcium and increased um, conduction of potassium. And ultimately, that hyperpolarizes cells, so it kind of makes them shut down a bit. And this modulates our sense of emotional tone and reward and pain. So commonly used opioids, I'll go through the most common four or five here. Um, morphine, kind of the quintessential, the one that started it all. Intermediate acting, um, it is metabolized by the liver like almost all opioids are. It has active metabolites that are renally excreted, so you need to be careful with this medication in people that have uh, renal insufficiency. We're probably all aware or have seen patients in whom morphine causes histamine release, which can be very uncomfortable and in extremes even cause uh, some uh, systemic changes. The nice thing about morphine is it's available in almost every type of preparation, IV, IM, PO, suppositories. So if somebody needs to get pain medicine, you can almost find, always find a route with morphine to give it to them. Probably the most important factor on this slide, though, is the peak effect. And this is something that we as physicians need to be aware of and as nurses, and we also need to let our patients be aware of. These medicines don't work instantaneously, so you need to prepare and match your level of uh, activity with the peak effect of the opioid. So I always tell patients if they're taking oral morphine, if getting up and walking is your trigger and it worsens your pain, don't do it for 30 to 45 minutes after you get your morphine. If you try to get up and walk right away in the morning, once you wake up, ask for your morphine watch a TV program or stretch a little bit in bed and then go walk, you'll do better. And they typically listen and they do better. So Demerol or Meperidine, this again is an intermediate acting uh, opioid, not really used for pain management or uh, pain control as much anymore because it again has active metabolites, some of which are proconvulsant. It can increase ICP, it has a host of drug-drug interactions, also causes histamine release and it has uh, quite a history with causing euphoria and having an abusive potential. So I, at least you know, my exposure to this now is probably in the PACU where people are shivering and it's still very good for post-operative shivering. If people are on of it or on uh, Demerol for pain, you really want to try to keep their dose less than 600 milligrams a day. So hydromorphone or Dilaudid, this is one of the opioids that I'm using more and more uh, these days. It, again, is intermediate acting with a very similar peak effect to morphine. Now, with regard to analgesic benefit, it has no active metabolite, so it's one that we frequently will use in somebody that has renal insufficiency. It, again, is available in IMIV and PO forms. There's even a long-acting form out there now called Exalgo, which I don't know if you've seen any patients on it. It's not usually approved by many formularies, so um, we don't deal with it much, but it is starting to make its way into the marketplace. Fentanyl, we're probably all familiar with this. It's very powerful. It's very short-acting. It's available in IMIV, transdermal, and transmucosal routes, no oral route. The transmucosal route is almost exclusively reserved for cancer patients. You have to have a special license to uh, prescribe it. 
It has no active metabolites and doesn't cause histamine release. So in people that have reacted poorly to other opioids, um, this is a good one to try. I'll talk a little bit more about the transdermal system in subsequent slides. You might see patients that come into the hospital on this for chronic pain management. It's very difficult to treat acute pain or rapidly changing pain with this system because it takes 12 to 24 hours to really see the effect of whatever changes you made. <clears throat> An oxycodone, part of Percocet, again, intermediate, intermediate acting, no clinically significant metabolites, even though one of the metabolites is oxymorphone, which is a very strong opioid, but it's only available in PO form. So this slide here is on equal analgesic potency, and uh, there are many different tables like this. The thing to realize is that this is really a guide. It should be used in, in uh, combination with your clinical judgment. A lot of the things that went into making tables like this uh, were insufficient to really make an equal analgesic potency. By this I mean some of the studies that led to making these tables weren't designed to determine equal analgesic potency. Or they looked at one or two dosages and we know that different dosages can have different effects and be treated differently by the body. But if you look from the left to the right of the table, you see basically the equal analgesic ratios from IV to PO. And this reflects bioavailability. So if you look at morphine, you can expect that morphine's bioavailability from the gut's about 33%, which it is. If you look from top to bottom, you see the relative potencies of the different opioids. So in the same realm as morphine, you have hydromorph or, uh, hydrocodone as well as oxycodone. Stronger would be uh, hydromorphone and weaker codeine and uh, meperidine. Now methadone, I have those red uh, question marks. That should also kind of clue you in that this is a little bit of a danger area as well as a what should I do area. And the thing about methadone is it's used for multiple reasons, addiction, chronic pain management, um, and it's a tricky drug, and we'll talk more about it. You probably shouldn't manage it or prescribe it unless you're fully aware with all the different nuances uh, to the medicine. So whenever you're trying to convert somebody from one opioid to another, you have to pay attention to the equal analgesic potency tables, but then this issue of cross-tolerance. Cross-tolerance, at least complete cross-tolerance, suggests that if you're tolerant to one opioid, say morphine, you would be equally tolerant to another, such as oxycodone. What we know is clinically this isn't relevant. In fact, what we show as humans is incomplete cross-tolerance, which is to say that just because you're tolerant to morphine doesn't mean that you're equally tolerant at all to oxycodone. So in effect, what happens is the new opioid is relatively more potent than the equal analgesic potency tables would suggest. So to prevent overdosing your patients, when you convert from one opioid to another, use the equal analgesic table first, and then reduce what that suggests by 30 to 50% because of this incomplete cross-tolerance. This is an example. So convert patients from MS Contin, 300 milligrams daily, to OxyContin. And I'll give you a minute or two to um, uh, do this, and then if somebody wants to shout out what they think the new dose should be, that's great. Any thoughts? I'm sorry? 100? 180. 180? Yeah. <laughs> so good. I think actually both of those are very reasonable. So if you look at the equal analgesic potency, 30 milligrams of morphine is equivalent to about 20 milligrams of oxycodone. So we use this just to say that to get us to the equal analgesic potency of oxycontin, we should be at 200 milligrams a day. Now, because of incomplete cross-tolerance, you should reduce by somewhere between 25 and 40 percent. So if you reduce by 40 percent, you're looking at 120 milligrams a day, 
20%, you'd be at 180. So both of those things, very reasonable uh, recommendations. And this is really the basis of something that we call opioid rotation, which is to say that instead of going up and up and up on the same opioid over time, simply, simply change the person to a different opioid, and then you can actually reduce their relative dose, but get the same bang for your buck because of this issue of incomplete cross tolerance. So patient controlled analgesia, is this something that you use here often? Good. Um, it's widely accepted, it's considered more effective and safe. Um, numerous studies have shown that patients actually have the same if not better pain control and use less opioid when they're given a PCA. It has a built-in safety mechanism in that the patient has to be awake enough and cognizant enough to realize that they have to press a button to get their opioid medication. If they become too somnolent, they won't press the button until they're awake and coherent enough to press the button again. These next two slides, and there's a lot on these slides, just as basically our order set. I'm sure yours look fairly similar. But at Mayo, we typically have morphine, hydromorphone, and fentanyl PCA uh, order sets. In the two years I've been there, I think I've managed one or two morphine PCAs. I've never uh, actually written for one. We almost always go with hydromorphone or fentanyl. Hydromorphone is easier to titrate. Um, it has less histamine release, so people typically tolerate it better. If patients really have uh, kind of incident pain, so they've got high spikes of pain, fentanyl is a really good option because it's quick on, quick off. The problem with fentanyl in somebody that has constant pain throughout the day is it doesn't hang around very long, so they're constantly pressing the button. In that case, we usually convert them over to a hydromorphone PCA. Now we have three different levels. Level one would be somebody that's maybe opioid tolerant, or I'm sorry, opiate naive, that has had surgery and needs opioid medications for a day or two. Level two would be kind of your opioid tolerant patients. Um, and then level three would just be severe uh, pain of any sort. Oftentimes people up in here are your very opioid tolerant patients, your cancer patients. Any patient that gets a PCA also gets uh, the reversal for opioids, so Narcan. Uh, we typically recommend, as almost everybody knows, not to give the full dose if you feel like somebody's too uh, somnolent or has respiratory depression. That can precipitate extreme withdrawal, uh, hypertensive crises, and people have stroked or had uh, myocardial infarctions in that setting. So usually we give about uh, 40 micrograms at least as a starting dose. <clears throat> we monitor everybody for sedation. If patients are not sedated and their pain is unrelieved, then they move up to the next level. If their pain is relieved, then we start backing them down. And all patients that are on a PCA are typically converted to oral opioids once they can tolerate um, you know, food without significant nausea or vomiting. And there are many different ways to do that. In general, though, I'll look back what they took for the last 24 hours, 12 to 24 hours, and give them the equal dose to that in an oral form. It's pretty easy if you're going from hydromorphone uh, IV to hydromorphone PO, just multiply by five. And then I cut the PCA in half and I check back with them, with them later on in the day and make sure that their opioids uh, through the PCA are going down. If they're not, I typically have a conversation with them because a lot of times it's again about patient education. If you don't say, I'm giving you the oral medicine and this is your primary and only use the PCA when you're in trouble or you're having an extreme uh, attack of pain, they're just going to use the PCA because it's still available to them and they don't have to bother somebody else. So you really need to instruct them, use the oral first, use the PCA only as a backup. And then typically you can convert people off in 24 hours or less. Sorry this is a bit granulated. This is from uh, Haspy, or Happy Hospitalist blog. So I've trained my doctors to write for PCA morphine with a basal rate of less than one call light request per shift. Wouldn't that be great? But I put this on here to say, at least not right away in the admission do I recommend a basal uh, PCA rate. That kind of nullifies the built-in safety mechanism. In some patients, it might be reasonable, but you really want to get a sense of how they are acting in your presence because oftentimes patients don't know exactly how much opioid they're on as an outpatient or they're not telling you on purpose or they're just forgetful. So you really want to make sure that you're doing uh, what's safe by them. 
So now we'll go into kind of some special scenarios. Um, these are just you know, uh, a little bit more tricky concepts or things that we might not encounter every single day, but probably will encounter in a week of inpatient opioid management. The first is uh, transdermal fentanyl delivery system, so the fentanyl patch. It's available in multiple different preparations, and you change it every three days. It forms a depot under the skin, so if people don't have a lot of fat stores, so your uh, cachectic patients, typically these don't work very well. Now, when you put on a fentanyl patch, the dose increases in the plasma over 12 to 24 hours. The important thing to realize is that even the lowest dose here is equivalent to at least 30 milligrams of morphine a day, so this is not for opioid naive patients. When I consider this, is it if people are having constant, moderate to severe pain from malignancy or they don't have a reliable oral route? We do a lot of ENT, head and neck surgeries where people either um, you know, are NG dependent for months or they may never have a reliable uh, route where we could crush, crush long acting opioids, then the fentanyl patch might be reasonable. <clears throat> so here's another uh, case or problem. So the ratio of the equal analgesic potency table was one microgram of fentanyl is equal to 100 micrograms of morphine. So uh, fentanyl is 100 times more potent. So based on that, um, somebody's taking 100 milligrams of MS content two times a day. They're not going to have a reliable oral route where you could crush the MS content for at least two months. You want to put them on a fentanyl patch. So what would you put them on? Any thoughts? Yeah, this is a little bit trickier, so we'll go through the math. So method one, they're taking 100 milligrams two times a day, so they have 200 milligrams OME daily of morphine. If you use that one to 100 ratio, 10 micrograms of fentanyl is equal to one milligram of PO morphine. And then you have to convert days to 24 hours since the patch is per hour. If you do that, you get 83 micrograms an hour of fentanyl. So that can take a while, and there's many potential missteps that you could do. The second method is kind of dirtier but quicker, more simple. It basically is take their oral morphine equivalent and divide it by two. So there you get 100 micrograms an hour. So would you just go ahead and throw on one of these patches then at these dosages? Probably not, again, because of that concept of the incomplete cross tolerance. So you should decrease again by 24 to 40%. So you're re really looking at more of like a 50 to 75 microgram an hour patch. The way that I would do this, because I'm always on the conservative side and it's much easier to put on more than take some away, is to place the 50 microgram patch. Now if the patient doesn't have an oral route when you're uh, addressing this, then it's good to give them intermediate acting um, uh, morphine or oxycodone, or a PCA. However, if you're converting from somebody that can take a long-acting oral opiate like MS Contin, what you would do is put the fentanyl patch on in the morning and give them their normal dose of MS Contin. Then at night, when they would normally get 100 milligrams, you give them 50 milligrams, so half the dose. And then by the next morning, they should pretty much be covered by the fentanyl patch. And at that time, you're not accounting for any long acting anymore, it's simply just a breakthrough pain and you may have to titrate that because the tables are only so accurate. So methadone. We talked a little bit about that this is a scary drug, um, it, but it's very convenient in some ways. There are no active metabolites, it works on the opioid receptors, it also works as an NMDA antagonist which we know plays a role in chronic pain. So it's very good for neuropathic pain uh, cancer-related pain and reversing opioid tolerance. It's inexpensive. Does anybody know what it would cost a patient that's taking the equivalent of 160 milligrams a day of OxyContin, what a month's supply costs? Any other thoughts? 
<laughs> so it's about $1,000. Very, very expensive. Now, what would the equal analgesic potency or the equal analgesic dose of methadone cost for a month's supply? Okay. That's about $20. So significantly less expensive, especially in patients that have uh, financial concerns. Very long half-life, and it's hard to predict. I mean, this is kind of crazy that it can be 15 to 55 hours. So how do you titrate in this medication? The idea is slowly. Whatever you give somebody, you need to wait at least three days, if not five to seven days, before you even consider changing the dose again so that it reaches a steady state. There's tremendous uh, interpatient pharmacokinetics. There are tons and tons of drug interactions from uh, antibiotics to anti-cancer agents, uh, anti-epileptics, so you really have to be on top of it. It's a poor choice when trying to rapidly adjust doses, as we already talked about, and complex dosing. It can also cause QTC prolongations, and lots of other medications can as well, including other opioids like oxycodone and fentanyl. So if somebody comes into the hospital and they're on methadone and they don't have an EKG in your system, you should probably get one. And if you're managing methadone or changing the dose, you probably want to get one before you start, within three to five days of starting, and then once they hit uh, their steady state at about a month, and then yearly after that, just to make sure that somebody does, doesn't develop a QTC of 630 or 650 or worse torsades or something. <clears throat> so this is methadone dosing. And I've looked at this table probably 50 times, and I never remember past the first line. Um, because it's really tough. And what it suggests is that the more opioids that patients are on, the stronger methadone becomes. So if they're taking less than 100 milligrams of OME, use a 3 to 1 conversion ratio. If they're taking more than a gram per day, use 20 to 1 or higher. Sometimes people even say 50 to 1. So single ratio is not applicable to all patients. The good news is, if you actually do the math on this, the, few, the confusing becomes a little bit more simple. And this is kind of the level that I like to think about it as. So if you do all the different ratios, for somebody that's taking 100 milligrams of morphine a day, it's roughly 30 milligrams of methadone. If you do the ratios all the way through, you see some commonalities, somewhere between 30 and 50, 30 and 60 milligrams of methadone a day. So if you count for cross tolerance, if somebody is taking at least 100 milligrams of morphine a day and you give them 5 to 10 milligrams TID of methadone, you're going to be in the ballpark. You'll probably be undershooting a bit, but you know, again, this is a medication that takes a while to get the right dose and that people are going to be on for a long period of time, so you have some time to uh, make adjustments. So special scenarios, we all have patients that have uh, varying degrees of liver and renal disease. Um, because the liver metabolizes all the opioids and a lot of the opioids and their metabolites are renally excreted, changes in the functions of these systems increase the risk of side effects and overdose. So we should know about what opioids to think about in these different patient populations. So this is from uh, paintopics.org from 2007, but it really references all of the major articles um, that look at opioid management in renal insufficient patients. So basically, if you have a renally insufficient patient or a kidney transplant patient, I would encourage you to think about hydromorphone, oxycodone, methadone if they're already on it, and fentanyl, because these are really not too affected by renal insufficiency. Morphine will be, certainly codeine because it has to be converted to morphine, and then meperidine are pretty much not recommended. If you want to be on the conservative side, again, start people on the low dose and just make sure that they are acting in the way that you'd expect. But again, hydromorphone, oxycodone, fentanyl are pretty good in renal insufficient patients. If patients are on dialysis, you have to know whether or not the medicines will be removed by dialysis. If it is, in the case with morphine, the pa patients are at risk for rebound. And again, this could cause uh, bad things. Patients that are cirrhotic or have uh, significant degrees of liver dysfunction are another area of debate. Some people believe that because of the change in the pharmacokinetics that 
uh, cirrhotic liver patients should get opioids, even if they have pain, because it's just simply too dangerous. Um, the palliative care group and the pain group out of Mayo has a slightly different take, and this was a rebuttal um, to sentiments that cirrhotic patients shouldn't get opioids. And basically they said it's almost unethical and unreasonable to withhold pain medicines from people on the fear that it could cause uh, um, you know, problems. When in reality, there are good recommendations that we just need to be aware of. And that is if you're using morphine, you should increase the dosing interval. So typical dosing interval for morphine is three to four hours. Consider going to six hours. If you're using hydromorphone or oxycodone, uh, just decrease the dose by about 50%. So be careful and monitor. That's probably the best uh, take-home message here. So opioid-tolerant patients. already talked about that we're seeing a lot more of these at Mayo, and I'm sure you are here. Um, these are kind of the risk factors for predicting who the difficult uh, pain people are going to be in the hospital, and we can probably just eye them from outside the door almost. But chronic opioid use is a, a big risk factor, as is gender, males, uh, young age. If they have anxiety or depression, it's good to really tease this out early on, because if you're trying to treat someone's anxiety with opioid medication, it almost never ends well. Um, and sometimes just simply talking to them helping them focus. I always tell people deep breathing is your best friend. It calms your body. It releases your body's natural endorphins. And even if all the medicine dried up in the hospital, you could do that yourself anywhere you are. So you give them and empower them to take control a bit. So tolerance, we're probably all aware of what this is. But simply, you need a larger dose of the opioid to give the same analgesic benefit. And there are a few human studies on this, exactly why this happens. It could be changes in uh, the enzymes within the liver, it could be downregulation of opioid receptors. But it really is kind of that classic case. Doc, the medicine works well, but I just need to take it more often or a higher dose, and it still works well. This is, and in this case, this is a good patient to consider the opioid rotation switch to a different opioid, but don't increase the dose. This is in distinct contrast to opioid-induced hyperalgesia. Are most of you familiar with what this is, or have you seen it? So it's almost a paradoxical reaction, where patients are given opioids, and the exposure to the opioid medication makes them more sensitive to painful stimuli. Lots of us think that you have to be on high doses for a long period of time, and that's simply not true. Opioid-induced hyperalgesia can occur within the first week or a month of being on opioid medications. So the clinical scenario here would be somebody comes in or you're in the hospital and the patient gets oxycodone and you walk back in a few hours later or in day two or three and they're saying, my pain's a lot worse. So of course you're going to make sure that something hasn't changed physiologically that would cause them to have worse pain. So you go up a little bit and you come back a few hours later and they're like, my pain is just worse and worse and worse. So you're actually hurting yourself because with every dose of opioid, their body is becoming more sensitive to all the non-painful stimulus around them. Obviously, in this case, your best friend is to titrate off the opioid medications. Think about adjuncts, Tylenol, NSAIDs, ketamine, neuropathic pain agents, regional techniques. You really just need to get them off the opioids, though, and you'll be quite a bit ahead. And there's a lot of questions about why this exactly happens, but I don't think we really know. <clears throat> Certainly, we've all seen our uh, patients that abuse opioids or uh, have addiction. They often don't admit to using opioids at all, or they underestimate how much they, they use. There's a big um, uh, coinciding risk of comorbid psychological disease. Primarily, anxiety, depression occurs about 30 to 40 percent of the chronic population and even higher in people that are addicted or abuse opioids. But we really have to balance this against our own prejudices. That may lead us to assume somebody's addicted or abusing because they're requesting higher doses, maybe than we're comfortable with. We just want to make sure that these prejudices don't lead us to not give medicine to somebody that has a real reason for needing it. This is kind of one of my uh, personal um, initiatives right now when I'm on the inpatient pain service. We're a tertiary and quaternary referral center. So it's easy for us to see patients in the inpatient setting, get them on this great opioid regimen, 
send them on out and just assume that the primary care physician or whoever they see states away is going to be comfortable with this. The best thing for the patient is to make sure that they have continuity of their pain care. So what we started to do is if we're at a decision point and we could go in oral long acting, so OxyContin or a fentanyl patch, and we're trying to figure out which is best for the patient and we can't based on just their uh, needs, I'll oftentimes call the physician at home and say, this is kind of where we are, this is what we're thinking about doing, what's your experience, what are you most comfortable with? Because whatever they're most comfortable with and what the patient's going to get managed at home, that's the direction that you should push them. So patients assume that they'll be given a reasonable supply of opioids from the hospital. This isn't necessarily hundreds of pills. If they aren't on opioids before the hospitalization, they should probably not be in them in the majority of cases afterwards. But you have to generally reduce opioids by 20 to 30 percent every three to five days. So when I talk to patients, I say it might take you about a month to get back off these opioids. Um, sometimes it takes longer. But if they're high risk, maybe you send them out on only a week. Again, having touch base with the primary care physician to make sure that they can have follow-up within that week to get the next tapered dose of opioids. <clears throat> so final thoughts. We focused a lot on opioid management here, but I really uh, would not be doing justice to the topic if I didn't promote responsible polypharmacy, things like Tylenol, uh, NSAIDs, COC-2 inhibitors, you know, TENS unit, massage, acupuncture, heat, ice. If you're really interested in this topic, I don't know if you have access to our Mayo uh, intranet, but the anesthesia website has some good conversion calculators. Global RH, the website, is also a good one. One of my favorite books, though, that I read in fellowship and uh, continue to refer everybody that I teach to is this Demystifying Opioid Conversion Calculations by Lynn McPherson. She is a uh, farm D. I've never seen her speak, but apparently she will make you roll on the ground. She is just funny, but she's also really good. And some of these examples were similar to things that you'll see in her book. So I'd highly recommend it. It's about 130 pages and $25, something like that. All right. Thank you. Are there any ethnic considerations of significance? Um, you know, not as much with these med. Certainly, I would say to an extent there are, um, but they're pretty. I guess they're not widespread. Certain patient populations, um, uh, some of the Hispanic populations and, and Asian populations, typically don't ask for pain medicines as much. They tend to be a little bit more stoic in things. Um, usually I haven't seen too many barriers when you go in and explain to people that tolerance is unavoidable. It happens to everybody. Most people are more concerned about the social stigmas or addiction. And I say that's really my job to screen to make sure that that isn't an issue. And then for you to be honest, you know, going forward. And typically in that case, Patients, once they get their first dose or two of the medicine that we're recommending, feel so much better, and their families can see the improvement that it's more accepted for the rest of the hospitalization. But it's a good thought. <clears throat> All right. Thank you very much.